morning. How you doing? You doing good? All right. I just want to share a couple of things this morning. In Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, it says this. It says, How shall they call on him whom they, whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they had not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I want to talk a little bit this morning about the call. The call. And I just want to hit on a couple of things, really four. The call to follow Christ, the call to witness, the call to a particular task or role, and finally, the call to vocational ministry. I want to look at the life of the Apostle Paul, because I think you see each of these in, in, in Paul as he is on the road to Damascus and he is confronted by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So if you look at Acts chapter 9, I'm going to turn there. Most of you know this story. The Apostle Paul was not the Apostle Paul at this particular point. He was a Pharisee. He had great zeal for the Jewish faith, and he was in the process at this point in his life of persecuting uh, the Jesus movement. Uh, Paul Paul, who was really called Saul at this stage of his life, was present during the trial of Stephen. And so he had heard what this Jesus movement was all about, how they had claimed that Jesus, this man who had been crucified on the cross as a criminal, as an insurrectionist, and was buried, that these Christians, so-called, were uh, claiming that uh, this Jesus had risen from the dead, and because of this, his resurrection, that he was the legitimate Messiah of God's people. And uh, that because he was Messiah, that he was essentially superseding uh, the temple and the entire sacrificial system, and that he was the one that was going to bring God's people into all of the promises that God had made to Israel, and that eventually this would lead to Israel becoming the focal point of the entire world, all the world would come to Mount Zion, Jews, Gentiles, everyone, and they would worship the one true God, and that this risen Jesus was the one that was going to usher this in. Well, Paul could not accept this. He was convinced that these individuals were, were heretical, that they, had, that they were dangerous, and so he had received permission to go out and to round them up and to take them back in chains so that they could be imprisoned or even killed. And so this is what he is doing when uh, he is on his way to Damascus to, to gather up a particular group of these, of these Jesus followers, when suddenly he and his party, there's a light from heaven, and it completely knocks him, you know, the, the, the way the tradition goes, it knocks him off of his donkey or his horse or whatever he's riding. Of course, it doesn't really say that. But... He is knocked to the ground, and he hears a voice calling out to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he responds, he says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So here he is. He is confronted by this Jesus that these crazy Christians have been following. Up until this point, he did not believe that Jesus was risen. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And here he is confronted by the risen Jesus Christ. And suddenly he realizes they were right. They were right. He is risen. And therefore, he is Lord. And it's at that point that Paul, or Saul, confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord and submits himself to, to this risen Jesus and asked him, what is it that you want me to do? Paul heard the call to make Jesus Christ Lord. It is this initial call to follow Jesus that is given to each and every human being on the planet Earth. We're all called to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. In uh, Acts chapter 17, after Paul is out and he's preaching and he's on his various missionary journeys, he goes to 
uh, the city of Athens. And while he's there, he goes to a place called the Areopagus, and he preaches while he's there. And one of the things he says in verse 31, 30 and 31 of chapter 17, he says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance that, of this by raising him from the dead. What Paul is basically saying is, is that we have now come into a new era, a new epoch, where, where whatever happened before has been changed. Now is the time for everyone to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. When he's writing to the uh, church at Rome in chapter 1, verse 6, he refers to the members of the church of Rome as the called of Jesus Christ. Everyone who responds and makes Jesus Christ Lord has been called by him to become his follower, to become his disciple. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says this, For it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men or people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men or humanity, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. He desires all to be saved, but the means of that salvation is a response to the call to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. One of the things that all of the students that are connected with the IFCA Bible College and SUM just got done doing was we came back from Mardi Gras, is we went out to the streets and stood on Bourbon Street and declared Jesus Christ is Lord. And over 400 people gave their life to Christ as a result of that. That is the first and foremost call that God is issuing to each and every human being. It is a reflection of the same call that God gave at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. Right after the fall, the original couple placed in that, in that, in that uh, sacred space, that garden, that, that idyllic place where they were to enjoy fruitfulness and fellowship with God, where they were given a purpose and a reason for being, where they were told to be fruitful and to multiply so that they could go out and represent as his image bearers to the world. And they were given one command and one command only. And we know from the story that they disobeyed that command. And right after that disobedience, God returns to the scene and he comes and he's walking in the garden and in chapter 3 verse 9 of Genesis he says to his his image bearers he says where are you where are you do you think God didn't know where they were of course he knew where they were he was issuing the call he was issuing a call to repentance he was issuing a call to come forth to not allow your shame and your guilt for disobeying to hinder you from coming to me and instead, unfortunately, what did they do? They allowed that shame, they allowed that guilt to override the call. And they blamed one another. And they blamed God's good creation. And they blamed and they blamed and they sidestepped. The first and foremost call of all humanity that we are called to respond to is to receive Jesus Christ and acknowledge him as Lord. But it's not just about conversion. It's not just about saying a prayer. It's about becoming a Christ follower. In Acts chapter 9, verse 19, it says, And so when he had received food, this is after Paul had come to Damascus and he'd been prayed for by Ananias, it says he was strengthened and he spent some days with the disciples. That's important. Paul needed to spend time with the disciples so that he could be discipled, so that he could find out exactly what is it that I've done. What does it mean now to be a Christ follower? We pray for people, we get people to say a prayer, but I think a lot of times they don't have a clue as to what they've done. Not really. They understand the need for, for salvation. They know that they need a Savior, but they don't know what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that's why we need to be discipled. That's why it's not enough to just get people to make a, say a prayer. We need them to come in and become followers of Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling us to. And that's what Jesus was calling Paul to. He was calling Paul to be a follower of Jesus. The second call is the call to witness. 
having responded to the call to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, Paul then obeys the call to be a witness in Acts chapter 9, verse 20. It says, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he was the Son of God. And we can look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus, just before he ascends into heaven, and he has his disciples before him, and he says, tarry in Jerusalem and you will receive power to be my what? Witnesses. We receive power to be his witnesses. In, in Matthew chapter 28, he gives the Great Commission. He says, go therefore and make disciples. We are to go. We are to make disciples. We are to be his witnesses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, Paul refers to us as ambassadors who go forth into the world and share the message of reconciliation. Last week we prayed a, or played a, a, a video for you, and in the coming months we're going to be talking about this, this program called Go 2020, right? It's, a, it's going to be a worldwide program where the Church of Jesus Christ is going to commit the month of May to being a witness and a real focus on that. And leading up to that, we're going to ask each and every one of you to have a list of, I think it's five individuals, five people, that don't know Christ that you have a connection to of one way, one sort or another. And we're going to ask you to come and pray for those individuals in the coming months so that when the month of May comes, we've prayed into the lives of these individuals that their hearts might be softened, that they might come to know Jesus Christ, and then we're going to focus on witnessing to them in the month of May. We are called to witness. We witness to one another in many different ways, though, don't we? We witness through our words. We witness by giving our testimony. But we especially witness by the way that we live. In John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And we've already heard this morning how that this current crisis that we're all dealing with could possibly be the church's finest hour. This may be an opportunity for us to demonstrate what the love of God looks like. In the second, or actually the third century, there was a persecution going on against the Christians in Rome. It was initiated by the Emperor Decius. It was one of the wider persecutions that were going on. Up until that point, most of the persecutions that the church was dealing with were fairly localized. This one was, was fairly widespread throughout the uh, Roman Empire. And while the persecution was going on, there was the return of a particular plague that the Roman Empire had already dealt with. And so what Decius did in order to add to the persecution of these Christians is he blamed the reemergence of this plague on the Christians. He said, it's because we have abandoned the old gods of Rome that the old gods are judging us and allowing this, this plague to return. It's the fault of those Christians. So it actually added and fueled the persecution that was already taking place against those Christians. But here's the interesting thing about that plague. As it broke out in Rome and up to 5,000 people a day were dying in Rome, most of the pagan worshippers, the worshippers of the, of the old gods and the pagans that lived in Rome, they were taken off. They were hitting the road. They were getting out of there, including those that were the physicians of that day. You want to know who stuck around and, and provided care and comfort to those that were ill, to those that were sick, and to those that were dying? The Christians. The Christians. Even, even in the face of, of, of contracting that plague themselves and some of them dying as a result of that. Those early believers had such confidence in the, the, their, the, the status of their eternal soul that they did not fear death. And they felt compelled to offer comfort and care to those that were suffering. And as a result of that, instead of uh, Christianity becoming something that people avoided, it actually fueled the growth of the early Christian movement. People saw how these Christians behaved. 
They saw how they lived. They saw the love that they had for one another, and they saw that the love that they expressed for their fellow neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. Sound familiar? In Scripture, and, uh, and, and, and the guys don't have these Scriptures, and I apologize, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 19, uh, the law pronounces a curse on anyone that does not treat a widow or an orphan justly. James picks this up in James chapter 1, uh, verse 27, when he says, True and undefiled religion is this, it is visiting the orphan and the widow in their time of trouble. Now, obviously, the, 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 the clear meaning of that is that we are, to, we are to treat those that are weakest among us, the orphan, those that are at the beginning of life, those that are young, those that are tender, as well as the widow, those are at, in their later years. I think the principle at work here is, is that God desires us from the very youngest to the very oldest to care for one another. That's the overall principle that God is, is trying to communicate to us in this passage, in both these passages. It's not, in this particular instance, I understand that it's the older populations that are most vulnerable from this particular virus. But I can remember a couple of years ago, there was a flu outbreak, and I think it was N1H1, if I were H1N1, where it was younger people that were the primary target. It was 20-year-olds, perfectly healthy 20-year-olds that were getting this, this flu. They were the ones that were ending up, ending up in the hospital and dying. As the Church of Jesus Christ, it is our responsibility to care for one another, to protect this house. This is a house. This is, a, this is God's house. And I don't mean the literal house. I mean the household, the household of faith. We are required to protect one another. When anyone in our population finds themselves in a position of vulnerability, so it is everyone's responsibility in this instance to look out for one another. If the younger folks are the target for some particular malady or, or, or virus or anything like that, it's up to us who are older to look out for them. In this instance, it's the older folks that are the target. Now, how, I just want to take a, a second here. How many of you have, have, have seen this, this notion of, of flattening the curve? Have you heard that term before? All right. So the context for that is this, that, that when uh, those that study the, the outbreak of viruses and sicknesses and pandemics and things like that, and they look at how these things spread, it's, it's like a curve, okay? It starts off and then it escalates as more and more people are infected until it reaches some sort of high point and then it begins to tail off, okay? But you reach a high point before it begins to, to tail off. One of the reasons that they're asking everyone to, to exercise what they're calling social distancing, where you avoid large gatherings, you stay home, you, you don't get near one another if somebody acts like they're sick or things like that. It's because what they want to do is they want to cut down on the number of people that are at the very top of that curve. They want to flatten it out so that we never get to the point to where we reach some high level of, of, of individuals that have, been, uh, that have gotten sick, right? So by keeping some distance, by canceling events, by doing these various things, they're hoping to flatten the curve. The thing of it is, it takes everyone participating in order to, to make that happen. Now, I'm going to share with you this. <clears throat> I believe that the enemy, you know, we talk about the, the problem with races and race relations and all of that. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a problem with, with generational relations. Okay, there's a problem where the younger generations, millennials and younger, versus those that are like the boomers and, and, the, and the generation after that, there is tension, there is conflict, okay? 
One of the things I recently saw that's, that's making the rounds, particularly among the younger folks, is that they're referring to coronavirus as the boomer remover. That's terrible. That's hideous. It's trivializing the fact that older populations are getting this sickness and they're dying as a result. They're, they're, the mortality rates are in double digits. It's terrible. But I'm going to tell you, I have seen some equally hideous things said by some of the older folks. Some equally antagonistic things said by older folks. Younger people are dealing with, with higher rates of depression that we've seen in other generations. And I see older people just kind of fobbing that off and saying, ah, you're a bunch of snowflakes. You need to buck up. In nowhere in Scripture do I ever see Jesus Christ ministering to someone who is oppressed of the enemy, referring to them as a snowflake. It's an oppression of the enemy. And you don't, you know, trivialize it by making fun. Ah, grow up, you snowflake. And so there's then this antagonism between the generations. If, there, if we're going to see the flattening of this curve, everybody has to participate. We had a meeting in our household because I have my son, Matt, who's 23, and we also have Elijah living with us, who's also, what, he's now 23 now, right? 24? And we had a family meeting, and I said, listen, I said, you guys, you don't have to be concerned about mortality rates when it comes to this sort of thing. Most of, you know, 20-year-olds, you guys get this, and you hardly even know that you have it. But here's the problem. If you just kind of go about your business without thinking about what's going on and all the rest of it, then you can become a carrier for this. And then you bring it home, and you bring it into our house, and then we become carriers, my wife and I. And then, God forbid, as we're ministering here at Richmond Heights Christian Assembly, we bring it into here. And let's just be honest. Look around. We have an older population in this place. It's going to take every generation cooperating to see this thing brought down. But it's the work of the enemy to create tension and antagonism and, and hostility between generations for each generation to just kind of look with, with scorn at the other. I'm telling you, that is the enemy. This is the opportunity for us to shine. This is the opportunity for us to heed the call to be witnesses to show what it looks like for the hearts of the fathers to be turned to the sons and the sons to the fathers. To be not just a multi-ethnic, but a multi-generational church where each and every person here is valued for the, for the gift that they are for the kingdom of God and is given an opportunity to express that, to express those gifts and to function and learn how to function within the body of Christ. <clears throat> okay, I'll get off the soapbox now. Third, we're called to a particular work or task. Having made Jesus Christ Lord, having become his disciple, it says in Colossians 3.17 that whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything that we do from that point on, we do as unto the Lord. And there will be times in our life when God is going to call us to do certain particular things. Chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, it says that after Ananias came in and prayed for Saul, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Paul had a particular task. Sometimes we're called to particular tasks. In Exodus 31, 1 through 6, they're in the process of building the tabernacle. The children of Israel have been delivered from Egypt. They've crossed over the Red Sea. They're before Mount Sinai. And Moses comes down and he says, God has given me the pattern and the design for his, his dwelling, his tabernacle. And God anoints particular individuals to do particular things. And in verse 2 of that passage, it says, I have called uh, Bezael the son of Uri, the son of Ur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all matter of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all, 
work in all manner of workmanship. So God called these individuals who had particular giftings for a particular task. Once the tabernacle was completed, we never hear what happened with these individuals. We don't know what they did after that. Maybe they kind of took those talents and went to work. But sometimes God calls us to particular things. It's been my experience that that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be your lifelong vocation. Sometimes God calls you to go to work at a particular place for a period of time, and then he calls you to go to work and do something else. That can cause some believers to have a problem and to stumble a bit, because they think, well, God called me to be a car salesman. How come I'm working on an assembly line? Maybe God was only calling you to be a car salesman for a period of time. For 22 years, I worked at Xerox, and the entire time that I was there, I knew that I would be there until God decided to move me on. And I've shared with some of you my testimony, how that I started off as what they call a vended service. I wasn't a contract employee, I wasn't a direct employee, I was what they called a vended service. And I was doing that, and then God gave the opportunity for me to become a contractor. And right after I became a contractor, they laid off a bunch of ended service. And then I functioned as a contractor for, a, for close to 10 years, and, and then I got to become a direct employee. And right after that, they laid off all the contractors. At one point, they laid me off on a Monday. But then by Friday, they called me up and they said, I'm sorry, we made a terrible mistake. We never should have laid you off. Would you stay, please? I learned from that that you're going to be where you're going to be, working and doing the particular tasks that God has called you to until he decides otherwise. And that may change. It may change. Lastly, there is the call to vocational ministry. In Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, now the church that was in Antioch was there. At, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, etc., and so forth. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. The reason I say that this is the point at which Paul was really called into vocational ministry is because they ordained him. They laid hands on him, and they commissioned him to do what God had called him to do. And it was from this point forward that Paul began to go out, and you were familiar with the, the term Paul's missionary journeys, right? He had four, four distinct missionary journeys. And it was at this point that he began his various missionary journeys. God calls some to full-time vocational ministry. Those that he calls, calls are often given various gifts. We call them the five-fold ministry gifts. They're listed in, Act, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And these gifts are given to the church. They're given to individuals for the benefit of the church, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, to come into unity, to come into conformity to the image of Christ, to avoid error, and for the body to grow in love. Let me just say a couple of things about vocational ministry. Number one, vocational ministry is not the pinnacle of ministry. It's not. This is not the pinnacle. You want to know what the pinnacle of ministry is? The highest form of ministry? It's to do what Jesus did. 1 John 3.16, the other John 3.16 says this, By this we know love, because he, lay, he, Christ, laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The highest form of ministry is not pulpit ministry. The highest form of ministry is to do what Jesus did, to lay down our lives for one another. That is the pinnacle of ministry right there. Every time you, you sacrifice your time, your talent, your finances, any time that you sacrifice for your brethren, you are engaged in the highest form of ministry possible. That's what Jesus did. He came to give his life on our behalf. 
If you want to practice the highest form of ministry, that's how you do it. You give of your life. So number one, vocational ministry is not the highest form of ministry. Number two, it is not for everyone. God doesn't call everyone to the fivefold ministry. He doesn't call everyone to the platform. Can you imagine what our service would look like if everybody was up here? You know, seriously. And again, this is not a, you know, well, I'm up here and you're down there. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that God has sovereignly chosen to gift particular individuals so that they might equip the body of Christ. Vocational ministry is not an end unto itself. It doesn't exist for its own benefit. It exists for the benefit of the body of Christ. Vocational ministry is critical if we're going to come into what God has for us and for the church. God chooses to use frail human beings to bring the body into maturity. Now, it's interesting. We live, you know, again, the call of God upon his people at this time is, is it's timely. I really wish Josh was still here, some of the younger folks, because I'm really talking to the younger folks right now. I'm speaking to younger people, and, and if there are no younger people here, you all know younger people, okay? Because of the technology that we have at our, available to us, because we live in a global community, because the church has been working for decades to translate scripture into other languages, there's virtually nowhere in the world that we cannot now go in and bring the message of Jesus Christ. The, the number of locations that, w- which are beyond our reach are virtually non-existent right now. Okay? And because of that, there is the potential to see a billion soul harvest. Think about that. There is the potential right now to see a billion soul harvest harvest but here's the thing it's not just a billion converts it's a billion disciples and so if we're going to see a billion disciples come into the kingdom of God we are going to need 10 million new vocational ministers and that's assuming that our ratio is about a hundred to one right In other words, every vocational minister, new vocational minister that we get is going to have 100 people that they're going to be discipling. We need 10 million new vocational ministers if we're going to see a billion soul harvest. You don't think God knows that? You think God knows that? Of course he knows that. And I think he's calling He's calling those 10 million. And he will be calling those 10 million. I know it's not terribly, uh, you know, lucrative to pursue vocational ministry. It just ain't. Most of these guys that are pastoring mega churches, they're, they're the teeny tiny minority. Over 75% of the churches out there have about 75 people or less. Okay? But I'm not going to become an advertisement for vocational ministry, but there are rewards. Okay? I can tell you for, there are rewards. But God is calling people into the ministry. Coming back from Mardi Gras, we saw over 600 hundred young people called into vocational ministry. And I know that there's more out there. You know someone. You know someone in your life that's called the vocational ministry. And if God is, if this is one of the critical calls that God is issuing, and I believe it is, then we as the body of Christ need to come alongside those individuals, encourage them to pursue that call. We're doing that with Joe Tedeschi back there. 
Joe is in our is, is our our local Bible college student. He is equipping himself to go into vocational ministry. And we're doing everything that we possibly can to help him to see that he graduates with little to no student debt so that he can immediately launch out into ministry because there's a billion soul harvest out there. But we've got to be willing to see those that are called into vocational ministry so that they can, they can participate in what God wants to deliver and give to us as his people, as his church. <clears throat> so, four calls. God calls us to repent, to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and be disciples. He calls us to be his witnesses, to proclaim the message of redemption in both word and deed. He calls us to do particular tasks or works in areas that he has placed before us, and he calls some to vocational ministry so they can use the fivefold ministry gifts to equip the body and do the work of the ministry. I'm telling you, this could be our finest hour. And this corona thing, this thing's going to come and go, I'm just telling you. Eventually, things will calm down. Everything will just sort of settle down and we'll all be able to gather together again and we'll all be able to go about our lives as if nothing happened. That's a big mistake. Don't go about your life as though nothing has happened. Allow this, this situation to fire your soul to, for you to realize the time is short. We're not given an open-ended contract in terms of how long we're here. We have a certain particular time on this earth and we're going to stand before Almighty God and we're going to give an account for what we do with it. It doesn't matter if you're young. It doesn't matter if you're old. These are things that we are all called to. And if, you can't, if you're not called to the vocational ministry, at minimum you are called to enable those that are. see the sum of this. I like that. Amen. 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 All right. I don't think I got you too long. It's 1230. So. Don't be afraid. Whether there's a coronavirus or, or crummy economy or whatever. It doesn't matter. We have a witness. We're called to be witnesses. We're called to respond. We're called to, to do what God has placed before us. And we're called to enable those whom he has called to function and do what God has called them to do. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us, that you have condescended, Lord, in spite of the fact that we rebelled and that we are stiff-necked and that we are rebellious when left to ourselves, Father, that you, you condescend to call us, to work through us, frail human beings, fallible, and yet you work through us and you give us this unbelievable privilege to to hear your call and to respond and become co-laborers with you we have responded to the call to receive jesus christ as lord and we are working to become better disciples i pray father that we as a body would become better witnesses witnesses not just in word but in deed that we would be effective that we would reach out and that we would be mindful and show preference for one another and that that would become a witness to this community and to this city. I pray that we, as we find ourselves with particular tasks before us, that we would do them as unto you, with excellence, serving you as our Lord and Savior. And finally, that we would be mindful of those whom you are calling into the vocational ministry because there's a harvest coming. We want to we pray the lord of the harvest to send forth laborers that we would work and we would enable those whom you have called to work 
these are our callings and we we respond this morning and say yes we are will if you're willing to respond to those calls i'm going to ask you to stand up i'm going to ask you to stand up if you're willing to respond to those those four calls that god has given now i know that we've that pretty much everybody here has received jesus christ and if you don't know jesus as your lord and savior I want to invite you to come down after service and I'm going to share, I'll share with you and I'll pray with you. We have a call. Father, I thank you for each one that is standing here and expressing their willingness to respond to the call that you have given us. And I pray that you would enable each and every one here that as you have promised that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit, I pray that each one here would be empowered by your Holy Spirit. They would be given boldness and wisdom and grace and strength to respond to the call. Bless us as we go forth from this place. We thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.